let's go back to Facebook because um, the Facebookers haven't had much of a look in with all this going on. Yeah, and I'm not getting all the messages there either. Curious. So I think I will just have to proceed um, as best I can. Uh, hopefully, YouTube will uh, play ball, as it were. <laughs> yeah, Jackie says, uh, how many sound engineers does it take to change a light bulb? One, two, one, two. <laughs> the internet is fecked today. Hello, Sunday, says uh, Kelly Edmiston. Thunder and lightning, the she aren't a good form, says Jim Conway. Yeah, that could be true. Okay, Mariana Dunn and Desiree Riley. Desiree says YouTube is working now. Brilliant, good, okay. Sorry about all that, folks. There were people who were saying hello. Uh, I, might, I might have missed a few on YouTube, um, uh, on Facebook. Um, for some reason, the phone isn't showing me all the comments. Pretend you're just talking to me, says Patricia Healy Sullivan. Marianne Dunn Kindia says, sound. Okay, right. All part of the adventure. Yes, exactly. So I am going to tell you a joke uh, just to kind of lighten the mood. Uh, there was a guy lost in the desert and he was craw crawling along and he was parched and lost and burnt to a crisp. And uh, he saw us, what it looked like a stall in the distance and he crawled up to it. And eventually he arrives and he says to the guy, hello, Kimberly, feel Sipola. Uh, he says to the guy at the counter, he says, please, I need water, water, please. <laughs> and the guy at the counter says, <clears throat> sorry, mate, I only sell ties, as in, you know, neckties. Says, you don't have any water. No, no, I don't. But there's a pub about 10 or 15 miles to the west. It, they'll sort you out. <laughs> and so a couple of days later. The guy comes crawling back. This time he's at death's door. He's barely able to move through the sand. And eventually manages to crawl back to the stand, the tie stand. And he says to the... No, the guy behind the counter says, well, did you have any luck with the pub? And the guy says, no, they wouldn't let me in without a tie. <laughs> I'm probably the only one who finds that funny. Rex Fortenbury says, can we have a jokes episode? Do not tempt me. Not allowed in without a tie, says Sandra Boothroyd. Yes, you saw that one coming. <laughs> Hello, all. Storms have been rolling through here too. Yesterday and today, says Catherine Woodruff. Hey, I can hear you joke, says Darina. Hmm. Some people are reacting and saying funny. All the comments have stopped. Yeah, it's a funny thing. ArchDB. I'm seeing them on um, I'm seeing them on the screen here in front of me. You'll have to forgive me. While at a camping event, a young man snaps to the Do you know what kind of spider that is? I peered out and respond, that's a damn big. A what? That's a damn big spider. <laughs> True story. <laughs> From Rowan Grove. <laughs> uh, Anthony is in the house in Whitney, Texas. Makes me happy, says Elaine Ding. Dent Lingenfelter. Candace says it made me laugh. YouTube okay now, says Neil. Brilliant stuff. Mike and Jeanette are saying hello to all the tribe. I'm not getting the messages on Facebook. I can only assume that today's thunderstorm activity, and there was some in Ireland as well, thankfully. Uh, there was a few strikes in this region, but thankfully nothing too close. But it looks like it may have caused a bit of chaos in the network. Good evening, Anthony and all the mighty Tua. I hope in all in good form, says Tom King. Tom King, great form. Thank you for asking. And it's very good to see you. Two cowboys are lost in the de de desert. They see a tree in the distance that has strips of bacon hanging off it. One of the cowboys yells, it's a bacon tree. We're saved. He runs up to it and dies in a hail of bullets because it w wasn't a bacon tree. It was a hand bush. <laughs> Hot in Colorado, says Lexi Erickson. Charlie Grover says hello. Steve Martinson rightly says groan. Yes, indeed. Candace says I'm watching on Facebook and no problem. Uh, 
do, do. Yes, back on now, says Mandy. Seems to be okay, is it? Is everybody okay? Grant. Um, Fallship, says Amy Wallace Dolan. Uh, so it's a bit random tonight. I'm reading the... Uh, but I can only see four comments at a time on the face. Hang on, if I, I wonder if I open that up. Um, will I see more comments down the side? I'm only seeing four at a time. Ah, there we go. That's better. That's better. Jim Conway says, Toronto, Fulcher, Jim, good to see you from AE's home place of Lurgan. Fantastic. Hello from Glasgow, says Patrick Ruddy. Light rain at the moment. Yeah, it's very dull here, you know, even though the uh, the storm has passed. Apparently, some people are still having difficulty with YouTube. I I'm sorry. It's... Uh, uh, it's uh, I don't know what to say. It's just one of those evenings. Hello from Edmonton, says Jenny Ann. Is in, that, of course, is in uh, Alberta in Canada. Gremlins in the wires. Okay in Wales across the water, says Sandra Boothroyd. Brilliant. The ancestors are wondering what all the fuss is about, says Patricia Healy Sullivan. Yes, indeed. Jim Conway says thunder and lightning. Is she? Oh, yes, we've seen that one now. Where am I? Oh, yes, the newest comments are at the bottom. Alex Casterton, good evening to you. Amy Wallace Dolan says, hearing you loud and clear. Paul Rick Okomsky says, lots of new discoveries still to be made. Standing stones, wedge tombs, souterrains. Yes, indeed, Paul Rick, that's the other side of it. There's so much stuff still hidden. And part of the reason for that is some of it has been damaged, of course. Anne Hurley, he just declares there's a blue sky here, but doesn't tell us where she is. Hi from Belfast up north. Yeah, I can see that there's an issue here. All right. Anyway, we will proceed as best we can. That is all we can do, isn't it? Um, yes. Sunny and hot like a sauna here in Mississippi, says Megan Walters. Steve Martinson says, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. No, I can't read that. I, I know the joke. Other people can read it. I guess I'm lucky. You always seem to get my messages. In spite of me being all the way in Louisiana, unbearably hot and humid here, says Desira. Yes, I was speaking to uh, another radio amateur on my radio um, at lunchtime today. And he, of course, he, he was in, uh, it could have been the Czech Republic. And he was saying, you know, Temperature 30 something degrees Celsius. I was laughing. It's like, you know, come over to Ireland. Uh, we, we have the coolest summers mostly. I think it was about 17 or 18 degrees Celsius here at the time. Kristen Gray Taggart, I think I said hello. But anyway, Sinead Judge, where did you get your bookshelves from? So hard to get these ones. They were specially made, Sinead. They are a custom made uh, bookshelves from a local carpentry firm here in Johada. Jackie McCandless is saying good evening uh, and a wonderful tour. Blessings from Stroud. Finally, I've caught the show live after two weeks viewing matchup. Catch up, I presume. Thank you for your mystical storytelling. Thank you. Darina McAnney says, we are a little in love with you, Anthony. Read that out, sweet pea. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Miserable in Dublin, says Burr. Is it raining in Dublin, Burr? Is it? Uh, I wonder is it on its way. Patricia McAteer is in Omeed in County Loud, says it's very drizzly and dull. It's very dull here. It's just not raining at the moment, as you can hear. Uh, Coda is making himself known. Uh, Rowan Grove says the cool summers are one reason I'd love to live in Ireland. We don't realise, actually, we complain a lot about our weather, but our weather doesn't usually hit the extremes too often, you know. Anne McCallum says, hello, Anthony and the Mighty to uh, back up in the 30s again in Windsor, Ontario. Looking forward to listening to you while enjoying a lovely Smithix. Oh, very nice. Uh, I was going to say pass it round, but you can't with everything that's going on. And in any case, you can't because you're on the other side of the ocean. But like, you know, let's not get these, let these things get in the way. Emer Galvin says, hello from Yorkshire. Hello, Emer Falcher. Welcome along. Deborah Williams says, it's 95 degrees Fahrenheit here in Hillsborough in Maryland. Wow. That sounds hot. Lois McCardle says, hello from Swartz, Louisiana. Il fait chaud. Yeah, it seems to be hot everywhere except for in Ireland. Nolan Proctor is on and says, hi, Anthony and Tua from Pennsylvania, where it's sunny and warm. Nice to hear it, Nolan. Good to see you. 
Jim Conway says, we have a fairies fort on the shore of the Ban River on a loop and between Loch Ney and the Ban called, is it Darnie? D-A-R-N-I-I, which is mentioned on Ptolemy's second century map. Wow, cool. Yeah, and Buvinda is mentioned on that map as well, the Boyne. Hello and much love from mid-Michigan, says Marion Thomas Ibera. Is that you, Mez Marion, from, from YouTube? Uh, Flower Child is saying hello as well. Hello. I'll get back to YouTube in a second. Susan Mullen Lacerna is in Rally NC this week where there was a hurricane, a 5.1 magnitude earthquake, and power outages due to tornadoes. See, I told you, we've nothing to complain about. Uh, I hope you're safe and well, Susan. Uh, me, me, Brian M. Lauren says, it's miserable in North Dublin, but good for the ground and my vegetable patch. Yeah, so I'm going to just look at the rainfall radar. There must be rain in Dublin heading this way, is there? Doesn't look like it though on the rainfall radar, but anyway, we'll see. Tarini Pendleton says, Banachti all, August. Banachti art, Tarini. Welcome along. Uh, Kelly Edmiston, who knows Louisiana very well, is uh, delighted to see so many Louisiana peeps in the house. Oh, to all, as she's saying hi to all the southern Tua. Alwyn Roy Badziak says hi from a hot Berkshire. Yeah, I believe England is getting a bit of a heat wave at the moment. Karen Gogus says, and I quote, Hello! Folger, Karen. Very nice to see you. Hope you are well. Yes. M Marion says, yes, Mez Marion here. Good. I've ma I made that correction. Desiree says, Erin Durrett is camping, but she wanted me to share her love with everyone. Well, I hope you enjoy the camping, and when you catch up with the episode, Aaron, uh, hello. Erica Rivertree says, Banachty, oh, Louisville, Kentucky. Hello, Erica. You're very welcome along. Anyway, I yeah, the, the technology was just doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things this evening. We're 20 minutes in, and uh, the YouTubers are actually only 12 minutes in. Now, Coda, we will do the episode about dogs in mythology next time. Okay, relax. Um, yeah, so I think we're okay. We'll just proceed then uh, with the episode. Oh, yeah, just want to make sure I haven't missed anyone on YouTube. Daisy Peters, Archaeo Astronomy Database, Flower Child says, Happy Monday from Las Vegas. We're happy to be here. Happy to have you here. Flower Child is laughing at the joke. Don't encourage me, honestly. Uh, Janet Moran says, ha, 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 Like the uh, King Theoden in, in uh, The Two Towers and Lord of the Rings when, when Gandalf is going to rescue him from the clutches of Grima Wormtongue. Uh, and he starts laughing. Ha, 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 You have no power here, Gandalf the Grey. Uh, Josie Weatherford says, hello, good to see you all again. Yes, indeed. I have the uh, comments from YouTube on the other screen. Uh, I'm normally on this screen. Forgive me for having to look sideways all the time. Janet Moran says hello to Anthony. All the lovely two are from Boston. Always glad to have the Bostonians in the house. Erica Bow says good afternoon again. Hello, Folger Irish. The full Irish GK says Folger from Tala in South Dublin. Hello again. Flower Child says your Morse code video is really nice. I know, Matt, we're mad. We're the only group of people still using Morse code. The radio amateurs, that is. Julie Flood says, hi, Anthony, watching again from Boston. Good evening to you, Julie. You're welcome along. Mandy, Mandy McCurl says, right, that's the washing in now so I can sit down. We had to take ours in earlier because there was a big shower coming. Coda must be giving a shout out to Bran up at Karnawadi in the Cooley Mountains, says Porig Okomiski. <laughs> Where does the name Coda come from, says Emer? I don't know because my daughter chose it for him. So there, I must ask her. Jerry Andrade says, hello, Anthony and Tua from a thundery Merseyside. Yeah, quite a few rattles. Apparently there were 600 lightning strikes over Wales in the afternoon and that storm was moving up in your direction. Anyway, what are we on? Uh, I have to do this officially, uh, let's call it 23 minutes because the YouTube one now is uh, behind because I had to restart it a couple of times. This evening's topic, as I said, and I dropped my pen. This evening's topic is a ah, slightly different topic to what we'd usually talk about, uh, an awful lot less mythology uh, this time, uh, and more about monuments, and in particular more about the sad state uh, of some of them, and the sad state of preservation of some of them, and the neglect of some of them. Now, I don't want uh, you all to get into a downer. I, I think it's just important in light of some recent events to highlight this stuff. And to maybe put it out there to see if there's something constructive we can do about it uh, as a community, because uh, it's um, 
you know, it's a great shame. Uh, so I'm going to be reading from, uh, I wrote a very, very lengthy blog post. Well, it'd be lengthy in terms of, you know, what you would consider a, a, a normal blog post. I call these ones my long read blog posts. You, you see those websites where there's a long read article and it takes you a while to get through it. Um, I will be throwing in extra commentary uh, and, and thoughts. So it's not uh, completely scripted, as it were. I'll be, uh, uh, what's the, uh, what's the, 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 uh, the terminology I, i'll be uh, diverging from the script denise murphy says i'm late and i say well first of all it's great to have another murphy in the house and second of all you're actually not late because we've just literally started the episode proper following some technical issues there were thunderstorms in ireland and britain today and and it looks like uh, they have affected the uh, the networks because things are a bit dodgy Anyway, look, you know yourselves, because this is, you know, it's not TV. If the worst was to come to worst and we had a breakdown in technology, we could always postpone till tomorrow, you know, or next week or whatever. It's not, you know, it's not cast in stone. Passage tombs are precious things. There are at least 240 of them in the Republic of Ireland and possibly many more. And of course, the reason we say possibly many more is because there are a lot of mounds that are designated mound or moat that where the classification isn't entirely clear and where it may indeed be possible that under that mound is a passage tomb. So for instance, uh, Mound B or the Dogdas Mound on the floodplain of Brunabonia is assumed to be a passage tomb, but it uh, presents as an earthen mound of 40 meters in diameter. We won't know until some archaeologist goes there uh, and, and investigates, you know, and, and digs a trench into it. Then we could find out. Find out. Alex Casterton says it's hammering down in Albion. Yeah, you guys seem to have got the worst of it this evening. Tara Lynn Zaharias says hello all from Colorado. Good evening to you. But their great age makes them cherished remnants of a long past era. The best known passage tomb in Ireland, of course, is Newgrange or Sheed and Broga, to give its its old name, in the Brunabonia complex in Meath, now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Yes, Kelly is saying share before and after photos on a regular basis. Yeah, and I've been trying to do that on the page here and also on the Mythical Ireland community. Just to kind of, I don't want to draw too much attention to it either, but we can't ignore it. Uh, and uh, it's it's something sadly that is happening and we must uh, try and uh, alert the authorities to it, see if they'll do more about it, basically. Before Newgrange was taken into state care, it was in a dilapidated, forlorn state, and the actions of vandals there in the 18th and 19th centuries are to be seen vividly in the graffiti etched into many of the stones in the interior of the monument. And so those of you who have been to Newgrange will have seen uh, that, in some cases, very deeply engraved uh, graffiti uh, by people who visited there and thought it was perfectly okay for them to scratch their names into the stones. Um, and, and, and now those uh, messages have been left uh, for posterity, you know. Jules' cousin says, I'm watering the garden as I listen. So hello. Hello, Jules Falcher. Good evening to you. In fact, the very survival of the Newgrange Monument was under threat at the end of the 17th century when the recently arrived Scottish Presbyterian tenant of the lands at Newgrange, Charles Campbell, ordered workmen to take stones from the monument for the construction of roads and farm buildings. A visit of the Welsh antiquarian Edward Cloyd, uh, please forgive my pronunciation if that's wrong, seems to have been, a, a lot of people just say Lloyd, uh, so I'm going to say that, and perhaps if there are any Welsh watchers, how would you pronounce L-H-U-Y-D? I'll type it in there. L-H-U-Y-D. Some of them say Lloyd. But if there is a correct pronunciation, please let me have it. Philomena Breen says, hello, Anthony. Wishing you all well. Hello, Philomena. Very nice to see you again. A visit of the Welsh antiquarian Edward, unpronounceable surname, uh, Lloyd, seems to have been fortuitous in preventing the vandalism from continuing. And we are fortunate that the damage caused by Campbell's disrespect and ignorance was not more widespread. 
And in fact, even in reading that, I'm sitting here and I'm going, well, we actually don't know uh, that it wasn't more widespread because there are, I mean, for instance, part of the Loch Crew complex disappeared. There were there were more uh, passage tombs there than are there currently. Um, and some of them were destroyed in previous ages. Um, now Brian M. Lauren says, was at Loch Crew on Saturday and noticed someone has scribbled some sort of blue paint or crayon on a standing stone. It wasn't there last week. They will end up restricting access to these sites. Such a shame. There's another example of just many examples of people just being careless and, you know, not just being careless, but behaving like vandals. A passage tomb at Ballygawley. Kristen Murray Endre says, late again, but I just finished setting up my new laptop. Woohoo! Greetings to and Anthony. Well, hopefully you can you can hear us uh, and see us, and that's maybe not so important. But hopefully you can hear us uh, very well on your new laptop, Kristen, and the very best of luck with it. A passage tomb at Ballygawley in County Sligo, known as Chach Collach Avera. The Collach is an ancient deity of unknown date whose name is given to many monuments and landscape features in Ireland. It is currently suffering a similar fate to the late 17th century Newgrange. As reported in the Irish Times recently, Sally Siggins is saying hello from Sligo Falje. Trenonoa, Sally. Uh, Aina Fernandez Fornell says, uh, it's too hot here. I would, I would be in Ireland enjoying this summer storm. Yeah. Seems to be that we're lucky that it doesn't get too hot here. Uh, as reported in the Irish Times and by Monumental Ireland, Someone recently removed a large amount of stones from the cairn there, leaving a cavity in the monument uh, big enough for an adult to lie down in. The damage being caused, and by the way, if you want to see that damage, if you go to mythicalireland.com and go into the blog, you'll see the second blog post down is about this subject, and you'll see that picture there. And that picture is courtesy of Simon Tute of Monumental Ireland, to whom we are very grateful. The damage being caused to our most ancient monuments led to archaeologist Dr. Robert Hensey warning that, quote, not only is there a fear that they won't be there for future generations, they may be lost to this generation, unquote. By the way, Robert Hensey is the one who wrote, uh, Nora Gaffney O'Connor is in the house, says, hello, Anthony, and is Mary Tua. You missed the joke, Nora. You'll have to rewind for that. Uh, but perhaps you're probably glad that you missed it. Joseph O'Hagan says, Evening from the Kingdom of Moore and Falcha, Joseph. Welcome along. Cheryl Ann McFetridge says, Cheers from Boston. I've missed everyone working. Oh, well, don't work too hard, but at the same time, has to be done, I suppose. But good evening to you or good afternoon. Hope you're well. Heavy footfall from increased visitor numbers at cairns and tombs on Ireland's hilltops and mountaintops is a problem. People are walking on top of cairns, causing damage, in some cases in clear defiance of signs distinctly requesting or ordering people not to climb on the monuments. This is certainly the case at Schlievnachalia Loch Crew, where the interior of Cairn T, the monument widely known for its equinox sunrise alignment, is now closed to the public due to subsidence. Despite this closure and despite the erection of new signs, people still climb on the cairn. And the main picture for today's graphic is a photo taken from the junction of the chamber and the passage of Cairn T. And if you look in down to the passage in that picture, you'll see there's like a, a stone abutting uh, across above two orthostats. Um, and it's part of, you know, it's, it's part of the ceiling. Well, that stone has cracked uh, in recent times. Uh, and uh, uh, that I think is the main reason uh, for the closure of the cairn. It's now locked and uh, people can't get inside because they're not allowed for safety reasons. Uh, and apparently the, th the thinking is that, um, you know, it, the subsidence is, ca is caused by that ongoing problem of people climbing the cairn. Um, and, you know, uh, if I was to call a spade a spade, got so bad that at the time of the equinoxes when there are opw guides there people were climbing on the cairn and they were being told to come down and not to climb on the cairn and they ignored the guides who were there telling them that they shouldn't be up there 
and there are pictures if you look if you do a search uh, if you do a google search for pictures on the images and search for uh current t equinox or lock crew equinox you'll see there's pictures clearly showing people standing on top of the cairn um, and there's a certain cottery of people to whom the rules don't seem to apply unfortunately we have them in ireland too the same sort of people who are alleging that coronavirus is a conspiracy and that they don't need to wear masks. But anyway, that's perhaps deeper than we need to go uh, with this one. At Queen Maeve's Cairn at Knock Norea in Sligo, similar ignorance continues. People walk on the giant cairn despite the signs asking them not to do so. But there is an even greater problem. By the way, if you want to see an example of that, there's a photo shared, wasn't it, on Save Irish uh, Fairy Forts is a very good page about the preservation and conservation of Irish monuments. There was a picture with the sign clearly saying don't climb on the cairn and people walking up and down the cairn. Some people like to take stones as souvenirs. So slowly, stone by stone, these great monuments of the Neolithic, some of them may date back as far as 3500 BC, are disappearing. Karen says, this is sad and disappointing on my end because I always thought that Ireland was taking good care of their historical heritage. They do so as far as I know, which is completely the opposite in my country, Turkey, that historical and natural heritage getting destroyed methodically. Ireland really should take care of their priceless treasures. Can't agree with you more in that regard. Jackie says, Clava Cairns near me, Inverness, have the same problem with minibus loads of outlander tourists wandering all over. Historic Scotland are trying to help. Yeah, and the same thing is, I think, happening at the Hill of Tara, where certain monuments are sort of fenced off uh, for periods of the year. And, of course, they're, they're, they're trying to come up with a, a sort of a larger, longer-term plan to look after it. Leave no trace, but don't take anything away either, says Sally. The damage in Sligo is devastating. The tombs, especially those which are unopened, should be left untouched. Tom King says, blatant vandalism. Call the authorities and process accordingly. Shameful carry on, absolutely. Megan Walter says it's complicated. In some cases, it's locals who have a sense of ownership, but no pride or understanding of what it is. Then there's stupid kids. Then there's ignorant tourists who thinks because it's not under guard, anything goes. It's a multifaceted problem. Yes, Megan, you're absolutely right. It is indeed multifaceted. Kimberly Halligan is in the house running late today, but happy to be here. We're happy to have you here. Even though the white quartz at Newgrange is cemented into the wall, uh, of the monument, the front wall, that is. That did not prevent someone from prizing out a sample a number of years ago and bringing, ho bringing it home with them as a souvenir. Years later, the staff at the Brunabonia Visitor Centre, which controls access to the monument, received a curious package in the post. It was a box inside which there was a white quartz stone and a note. The note was from the repentant thief, the thief of the stone had, he claimed, sorry, the theft of the stone had, he claimed, brought him years of bad luck, which eventually compelled him to return it by post to the caretakers of the monument. Adele Perth says, sneaking in late. Good morning, Pua. Don't you mean early, Adele? It, it, it must be ridiculous o'clock uh, in Adelaide. Uh, but a very good morning to you and happy Tuesday to you from all of us who are still in Monday. Neil Hughes says, avoid the footprints too, yes. Jackie says, there's a curse, though, against taking stones there, though. One American even posted his stolen stones back after a run of bad luck. Maybe more curse legends would help solve it. Yeah, exactly. As, uh, you know, protection of monuments by the fairies has protected a lot of monuments through the generations. It is certainly a great shame and an ex inexcusable tragedy that in the modern age of apparent enlightenment and widespread education that our ancient monuments should continue to suffer that the neglect, damage and shameless ravaging that has been a hallmark of recent centuries. And so this isn't a new problem by any means. Those who walk upon the smaller cairns at Loch Crew may not realise the great age of the structures upon which they stand, or indeed that walking upon them is contributing to their steady demise. And in that regard, uh, you know, for, for, the, for the sake of full disclosure here, uh, so that I don't appear to be hypocritical, um, you know, I have stood on them uh, and I have put camera tripods on top of them. They aren't adequately protected 
they are slowly degrading and the more people who come along and walk on them are going to loosen the stones of them and eventually the cairns are going to disappear and the stones are going to fall over and there'll be nothing left. There's precious little of some of them left as it is. So some plan would need to be put in place at Loch Crew. Uh, something along the lines perhaps of Fornox. Fornox is very well protected by that concrete dome that some people don't like. Um, it, it, you know, some people don't like it, but it protects it very well from the sort of damage that is happening uh, in in uh, in Loch Crew. Terry Lynn says, do you know if it if it available to do paper rubbings on some of the spirals? Of course, only done most reverently and respectfully. Yeah, th that is another sort of uh, controversial one, Terry Lynn, because I know people used to do chalk rubbings. And that can damage the stones. I'm not sure about the paper rubbings. Now, I've never done them. I've never done one. Uh, and uh, part of the reason I haven't done it is because I was some some somebody who was more expert in these things did urge caution with regard to how you do it, and uh, I wasn't prepared to do it at risk of damaging a stone. Uh, you know, even rubbing your hands on megalithic art, uh, running your hands along the artwork, is actually contributing to it. its slow erosion. So that one I'm going to have to leave to other experts to answer. Um, in fact. I'm sure uh, a quick email to the OPW would confirm what their policy is in relation to that. If somebody says to them, can I do a rubbing? I don't think it's allowed, but I'll check it uh, at another uh, date. Um, Kathy May Dayo is in the house. Says, Hello, Mr. Anthony. I'm too a fall to Kathy May. It's great to see you. Rowan Grove says, someone asked me for a stone from Newgrange. I picked up a very small white quartz chipping from the car park verge carried it inside the mound and brought it back out again for them. <laughs> Very clever, Rowan. <laughs> uh, Kelly says, heartbreaking kisses through my masked face. Do a midweek live from somewhere beautiful to make up for this difficult night. Give us a heads up, not under a stone. Ciao all. Yeah, I do appreciate that this is kind of a different type of episode and not as uh, uplifting perhaps as many of the ones that we've done. Um, so yeah, you might be right. We'd have to go, go back to doing something uh, more happy. Are we humans part of the entropy process, i.e., is it inevitable? Well, if we say that it is, we kind of create an excuse to do it then, don't we? You know, if we say that it's inevitable that these things are going to degrade, then, you know, that's that's like our a waving of the hand saying, ah, oh, it's grand. You know, it's sure they're going to disappear eventually anyway. Instead of, as I say, uh, you know, moving now to make sure that they're available to our future generations. I mean, part of the reason we're able to go to many of these monuments now is because previous generations uh, venerated them or at least treated them with respect. And in many cases, that was a standoffish respect, not a go there regularly respect, not a go there regularly and walk on it and stand on it like I do at Delft regularly. So this is an issue that uh, certainly is, um, one could say, uh, is full of... Um, mm, uh, contradictions, maybe is that too too strong a term? You know, I mean, Mythical Ireland. What do what do I do? I uh, promote interest in these things, and that promotion of interest maybe encourages people to go there. All right, when you go into Newgrange, when you're part of an organised tour, and there are tour guides making sure that you don't do anything silly. But when you go to places that aren't guided, that's I think more likely that where the damage is, and that's been borne out by recent actions. That's where the uh, uh, the damage has occurred. Now, where was I? Sorry. But those who bring metal detectors to places like Loch Crew, and that has happened, by the way, and this has been an issue at Loch Crew and other sites, are a particularly invidious coterie of criminals who have no regard for the laws or indeed for the sanctity of these ancient places. Apparently, some of these people believe that valuable gold or bronze objects may be deposited in and around these Stone Age monuments, which in itself is an indication of their own ignorance. One is unlikely to find a gold monument that predates metallurgy by hundreds of years. However, having said that, gold items were found by a labourer digging at Newgrange in 1842, but which were obviously deposited long after the monument had been built. I have speculated that it was this find that prompted the disastrous excavation of Douth five years later, when R. H. Frith and his colleagues from the Royal Irish Academy defaced and ravaged that great monument, leaving an enormous crater in the top of the cairn. Thankfully, 
They abandoned the excavation after two seasons, but uh, not before almost wrecking the monument or at least causing it substantial uh, damage. Barb Jordan says, after seeing your comet photos, it gave me hope that in 7,000 years from now, at least the monuments will still be there. One can only hope, Barb. Hard to know what, what what's going to happen tomorrow, never mind in 7,000 years. But, you know, we're, we seem to be the first generation that um, seems to think that our our own uh, privilege trumps everything else that has gone before us, you know. And, 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 and perhaps being far too... I'm, I'm painting too broad a stroke with that brush. We are still talking about a minority of individuals here, but it is a growing problem, and it's a growing problem that requires a growing uh, uh, custodianship. You know, it requires a greater vision. We can't just keep allowing uh, more visitors and more visitors to come to these sites unless we protect those sites and we manage the, the footfall in a way that makes sure that the monuments are going to be there in generations to come. Kristen Gray Taggart says, when I visited Ireland, I got the impression that there's more respect for monuments than there is in the US. I visited Ura Stone Circle, which, which takes a bit of work to get to, and I was amazed that there was no graffiti on it. I think that's probably because it's so remotely situated, Kristen, would it? Uh, in the US, I don't think there's a chance that something similar would have been untouched. In fact, someone stole a petroglyph from a state park in Southern California, jackhammered a panel of rock right off the main rock and took it. I don't know if it's ever been recovered. That's shameful. Yvette Tillemas says, Hi, hello to a hi, Anthony. My husband went into the Metropolitan Museum and walked up and rough, r roughed, rouched, roughed with one finger an ancient marble sarcophagus and immediately a large guard came up and gave him a talking to. We never forgot. We live in a leave no trace area and it's a big thing here with people damaging our ancient mountains. Now, there you go. At least there was somebody there to say, don't do it. Darina McGanny says, sweetheart, people are strange. Not your fault. Our Korarbe. Yeah, I know, but you have to, you know, you have to do something, don't you? Nora Gaffney O'Connor says, would education uh, on significance put Anthony's Mythical Ireland book on the school curriculum? I do think education is definitely part of it. Yes, definitely. Um, Sally Siggins, you know, that if you teach kids that these places are sacred, when they grow up, they'll have more respect for them and they'll teach their kids. It starts It starts with the kids. You know, education is key, says Sally Siggins. Well done on highlighting responsibility on every visitor decides to be respectful and responsible. Uh, Amy Wallace Dolan says, on the flip side of our monuments being abused... I used to rent some farmland in Westmeath, which is home to a large ring fort. I always thought it was an awful shame that it's prohibited to touch them. Surely there would be more benefit in encouraging farmers to maintain them, even under supervision of OPW, instead of allowing them to grow wild. Well, growing wild actually is a form of protection for them. But I do understand. I do think that there is a scheme under one of those... Um, oh, uh, one of those environmental schemes, farming schemes... There is a monument scheme, but I believe that the amount of grant aid that the farmer can claim is very minimal. And, you know, they're kind of really left to do it all themselves. You know, some farmers do actually fence off monuments. Uh, and I know I've, I've seen today a fence around a stone circle and, and uh, it, 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 there were some controversial comments under it because it's hard to know what to do. It's like, do you protect it or do you leave it, you know? There are so many of them up and down the country of amazing historical and local educational value, mostly uninvestigated. There is a case to be made for opening more of them to traffic. So, you know, you would take the pressure off then the key sites that are experiencing the damage if you had more access. Access is another problem. The vast, the overwhelming majority of monuments are on farmland and private land uh, and, and you're trespassing to visit them. And that situation probably could be doing with changing uh, in, or, in order to to balance things out a bit. And Patrick Ruddy says, surely there is an opportunity to create employment in this, uh, give people jobs, repairing the damage to the monuments and some of the authority to remove unwanted folks from the sites, arrests and fines for those who do damage. Absolutely, Patrick. But as you will see, and I hope I, I'm going to cover it, um, yeah, um, uh, very shortly, I'm going to get to it. Part of the problem is that some of these sites are remote. Uh, and so unless you've got somebody there 24-7 or cameras, it's very hard to do that. Barb Jordan says guard dogs. That's another way. Cameras and a loud horn, says Patricia Healy Sullivan. 
um, I'm in a brass band. Would that be a tenor horn or a French horn? Never mind. Uh, that's a silly joke, and it's not a time for laughing. <laughs> Megan says a parks system like we have here uh, for our U.S. national parks, monument rangers instead of park rangers. Yeah, and we actually do have some parks that are national parks with rangers in them, uh, but uh, they, they're generally not the ones that contain all the ancient monuments. They're more to do with, you know, lakes and forestry and wildlife. No harm protecting those things either, absolutely. Adele Perth says, no respect when there is a dollar to be to be made, unfortunately. Tom King says, reps. Yeah, it's one of those schemes, Tom. It's not TAMs or one of those. It's, 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 it's one of those environmental schemes. It might be, I'm, I'm not sure now. I think it's 75 to 100 euro for a monument on farmland in a particular scheme, maybe gloss, yeah. Um, you see, it's, it's so so little money. It's like it's, it's meaningless, you know. Farm animals can damage them too, says Yvette. Yes, and of course, in former times, uh, the superstition was that you couldn't allow your cattle to graze on a ring fort or a mount. They, even the cattle had to be kept off. Erect stocks for nearby nearby for tourist photos and shaming some. Joking, sort of, says Teresa. Yeah, well, I tell you. Um, some some measures, uh, extreme more extreme measures may have to be uh, uh, considered if this becomes a you know if this continues to be a problem. The damage inflicted upon Chakalakavera Kalyakavera in Sligo is significant. The indiscriminate removal of stones is a crime against archaeology as well as the ancient heritage of Ireland. Precious stratigraphy has been destroyed, possibly disallowing carbon dating of some of its layers. Those who perpetrated the damage may have believed there were hidden or concealed entrances or chambers beneath the stones, or indeed that precious valuables might be found. Particularly notable is the fact that this monument is difficult to see, this is the point I was just going to raise, is difficult to see from the surrounding terrain, and it takes physical effort to climb up the hill. Whoever did this knew the monument was there, and probably brought equipment such as shovels with them to the site to help them remove the stones. And herein lies the problem, folks. I've, I've made enough pilgrimages to sites on the top of hills. I can tell you, even in summer, you'll get blown out of it on the top of a hill in Ireland. It's just not practical to suggest uh, that, you know, we put people up there to guard them, unless we can create some sort of a massive employment scheme. And we would be talking a scheme employing hundreds of people, uh, perhaps thousands, uh, on a full-time basis, and then creating facilities for them uh, to make it uh, warm and dry and have uh, toilet facilities and cooking facilities for them in cabins or something nearby. So it just opens up such a huge area. It's like it, it just sounds so impractical. However, where there's a will, there's a way. And as you can see in the current COVID crisis, uh, the European Union and the Irish government I'm not quite so sure what the situation in the States is, and let's not even go there. Um, you know, they're, dip, they're finding money. They're finding funds uh, to try and prop up economies that are in serious trouble uh, over this crisis. And this is the way you get out of an unemployment uh, crunch, is that you create employment with, with schemes. And why not a monument protection scheme? These things are priceless. You know, we put such a great value on buildings in the center of cities. We don't have skyscrapers in Ireland, really. We don't have anything that's taller than 20 stories, probably, maybe 30. Um, but, you know, uh, buildings in the financial district of Dublin uh, that are probably worth several hundred million euros, are they more priceless than a 5,000-year-old Stone Age monument? I don't think so. And the thing is that we, we've, become, we've become so destructive uh, and reconstructive that we put up buildings uh, there was a factory built here in Drogheda at, for example in the 1990s for a very very large multinational company uh, that when that company finally pulled out and, and removed all the employment from that factory that factory was razed to the ground uh, and turned into uh, gravel tiny pieces of stone were terribly wasteful in that regard uh, so even if we do have a, a 300 million euro uh, bank building in the center of Dublin, uh, we'll probably tear it down in a decade or two to build something else. We can't have the same attitude with our ancient monuments. Simon Tute of Monumental Ireland says, the route up to the monument is tough going and it takes nearly an hour to reach the summit. 
Also, to create a hole that size would have taken some considerable time and effort. In other words, this wasn't someone who was just there casually and said, oh, sure, I'll take a stone out and see if there's that one underneath, and then I'll take another one and another one. It seems to be that this was somebody who had a plan, you know? Another cairn at Corrin Hill near Fermoy in County Cork was also damaged recently. The rate at which monuments are being damaged, vandalised, and even obliterated is stark. A Facebook community set up to highlight damage to the Irish monuments, which has gained 21,000 followers, regularly highlights such incidents. And that's the one I mentioned earlier. It's called Save Irish Fairy Forts Heritage Conservation Community. It is an offence to be in possession of a metal detector at monuments and sites protected under the National Monuments Act. Uh, but even that uh, is a weird one because uh, not all Irish monuments that are listed have that protection and the ones that don't have it there's a grey area over them who's protecting them who looks after them what body is responsible for them you know it is also an offence under Irish law to use a detection device to search for archaeological objects anywhere within the state or its territorial seas without the permission of the Minister for Culture Heritage and the Guild Act there are apparently severe penalties for such offences under the National Monuments Act 1930 to 2014 However, the existence of severe penalties does not deter some people from continuing to use these devices. The vandals and treasure hunters unfortunately take advantage of the isolated location of some of these monuments. It is difficult, nay impossible, to police these sites on a 24-7 basis, unless, as I said uh, previously, uh, that you concoct some sort of a massive uh, employment scheme and, excuse me, hire guardians for the whole lot of them. At Knock Row, Kilkenny, last year, they widened the roadway for ease of access. Sadly, the damage to the stones has increased considerably in the past year, says Martin Dohany. Education is the only route, says Brendan Kinch. All monuments cannot be guarded 24-7. However, there will always be those who refuse to be educated. That's true. There are just people who just can't be educated. They can't be educated about anything. And everything's a conspiracy. And sure, where is the information coming from but statutory bodies that they're, you know, paranoid about? And sure, they won't believe it. They'll, you know, some people just, you're right. Unfortunately, um, <clears throat> common sense is not a, uh, is, is not a, uh, guaranteed so there's no foolproof answer but educating the younger generation now will go farther than any other approach says brendan yes i think you might be right yvette says cameras run on solar power well they have been a deterrent at fly tipping sites uh, and bottle banks uh, I, I can't speak for other parts of ireland but i know here in Drogheda there's been an ongoing problem with bottle banks where people are coming along and when they're full they're just leaving their bottles and other rubbish lying around the place uh, and so they, they, they've, they're using cameras now to uh, to um, basically find these people, to identify who they are and find them. The RIC did that, lived in cabins overlooking Irish-speaking communities. Very well said, says Nora, crime to archaeology wouldn't damage pyramids, so why the cairns? Why do they think less of the cairns? Great idea, Anthony. Employment and education is key. Lots of live webcams and allow people around the world to make reports. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like, like um, you know, those live webcam sites where you can look at, you know, um, the centre of Madrid or you can look at the Champs-Élysées. There's webcams everywhere these days, you know. Um, it, it certainly might act as a deterrent. If somebody was going up to the top of a remote hill and they saw a camera on a pole, they'd be much less likely to do anything if they thought they were being watched around the world. ArchDB says... I often wish our economies were structured such that people interested in the ancient sites could make a small living monitoring, studying, studying, preserving and educating the public. Yes, indeed. It, it might be a shocking revelation to people, but Mythical Ireland is not my um, primary source of income. Uh, in fact, up until about three or four years ago, I, I had pre you know virtually a, a trickle of income from it. Um, I still have to work full time. Um, it is very difficult uh, to to... I would say it's very difficult to 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 have, you know, sustainable heritage projects. Uh, a lot of the heritage funding is 
like structural or capital funding for uh, development works and is given to a lot of community groups that are non-profit making. And that's, that's fair enough. I, I, absolutely. But you're right. It's like invest in people who are willing to, uh, to, to, as you say, monitor, study, preserve, educate. Um, it'll all come back. You know, that investment will come, come back. A fairy tree was removed for the building of the DeLorean plant in Belfast. It said that's why they failed, says Jim Con Conway. Yes, I've heard that one. And uh, Eddie Linehan was one of the campaigners who had a, a motorway or a dual carriageway rerouted to avoid uh, a fairy tree because he said it would be very bad news if you were to t knock it down and uh, successful in rerouting. Very sound point about environmental vandalism caused by large corporations. Well, there's another possible source of income is to ask uh, large uh, corporations to, to put aside a small uh, amount of funding each year to go towards the preservation of heritage. It's just an idea. Put cams on them and have people sign up to volunteer as watchers, says Kristen Gray Taggart. Kind of like what SETI does, having folks volunteer their time to scan for alien signals but with monuments. Yeah, I used to be a SETI volunteer uh, for quite a long time. Interesting idea, Kristen. <clears throat> in Namibia... N Namibia... In Namibia... <laughs> I'm thinking of my, uh, my. Uh, they wouldn't let me in without a Thai joke. Uh, in Namibia, Africa, they have volunteer tourism where you can work on safari conservation farms and reserves and help with animal conservation. A program like that with Irish monuments would allow for people across the world to help protect and conserve while learning more. Yes, very good idea. Uh, I feel like many would do that uh, work for a little if they had authority behind them to enforce the rules under the law yeah and in fact there are still the old-fashioned uh, unpaid custodians of monuments in various parts of ireland and they do brilliant work you know aaron solomon says good day anthony happy to be here very happy to have you along aaron welcome i'd help for sure, from the USA, if we had webcam watches, says Cathy. This seems to be an idea. Charlene says, me too. There you go. The worldwide camera is clever for sure. Good horizon watching too, lol, says Nolan. Well, do you know what? In all fairness, it takes a lot of effort to drive to a place and climb up a hill. Like every time I go to Lock Crew, and I haven't been there now in months and months, but it's an hour over in of a drive and then it's another 20 minute hike up the hill it takes quite a lot of effort to be up there first thing in the morning for sunrise or last thing in the evening for the sunset it's an idea those webcams i'm telling you i think they could work doesn't matter how remote they are history and respect for the like should be left for generations and heritage to come says sandra boothroyd yes indeed correct heritage were granted eight and a half million in the july stimulus budget 1.4 million of this is to National Monument Service to care for our monuments. And I would like to know, I'd really love to know how that money is going to be distributed. Um, is it all, is, is, it, is most of it going to end up in one particular chunk going to one particular monument complex? Um, you know, technology can work for us as well, as well as, it can work for us as well as against our community. Donna Fire is in the house. Uh, you're not actually that close to the end. I kind of I'm actually only half read. I need to move on. I, uh, I, I suppose I better speed up. Um, there's a lot of very good comments coming in here, folks. Aaron O'Leary says society as a whole has just become so self-centered. I don't know how we go back uh, to at least respect for others and important things. Yeah, that's true too. Thank you for keeping Mythical Ireland alive. Says Flower Child. Very glad. What's the names of the group again? Which group is that, John? Was that the? Uh, save the save irish fairy forts save irish fairy fairy forts heritage conservation community and i'm going to speed on and read through the rest of this um notwithstanding the difficulty of policing sites on a 24 7 basis uh uh Perhaps an increase in penalties should be considered. A high-profile prosecution of a treasure-hunting vandal might go a long way towards preventing future incidents. In any case, we do have a national police force on Garda Siachana. We could perhaps justifiably ask the Garda Commissioner exactly what resources there are to police our treasured monuments, and inquiries could be made as to just how proactive the Garda are in investigating such crimes. 
I don't like to be cynical, but perhaps such crimes are not very high on the priority list. And that leads us to a discussion of a wider and more systemic problem. There is a bigger issue here relating to the sheer number of ancient monuments in the Irish lands landscape and the severe underfunding of the preservation of our precious ancient sites. While the problem of the destruction, vandalism and general neglect of Irish prehistoric monuments is not a new one, the attitude of successive Irish governments of recent decades in relation to archaeology and monuments has not exactly been exemplary. We cannot blame the actions of a very small number of vandals on the government, and it would be disingenuous to do so. But there is a long-running perception that various governments have failed to recognise the true value of our ancient monuments, and that, outside of the big sites like Brunabonia, uh, in, in, and in brackets here, the visitor centre there was refurbished last year to the tune of €5 million. Euros. Heritage has been cash-starved and thus deprived of resources which would aid in its conservation and protection for future generations to enjoy. There is a perception among archaeologists, particularly those employed by the state, that the location of heritage and monument services in basements and at the end of long corridors, and I quote from one archaeologist, last door on the left, unquote, indicates the inferiority of heritage conservation in the minds of the powers that be and the underprivileged status of archaeology in general. It may be a case, folks, that we have so much of it that we take it for granted. But the, as I said, if you take passage tombs, and we know we have at least 240 of those, they are, as I said at the very outset, they are priceless. They are priceless. You take one of those away you can't bring it back again. There are 40,000 ring forts and the argument is constantly made that, ah, look, there's so many of those, they're everywhere. Sure, they're bound to get damaged and they're bound to, sure, you know, we have to, you know, we have to farm and we have to build housing estates and we have to build this, that and the other. And it's almost like the excuse is made for the vandalism of them. Notwithstanding that fact, there are a lot of landowners who protect monuments, just in case people think that that's uh, against uh, brushing uh, with a large stroke over a particular issue. There is a, uh, sorry, yes. In many cases, archaeology is only thrust into the public eye when accompanied by negative headlines, such as the Irish Times story about the damage to Chak Kalia Kavera. The saga around the routing of the M3 motorway through the Tara Screen Valley, close to the Hill of Tara, still leaves a bitter taste in the mouth. The chosen route was highly controversial and led to years of protests. The government has been seen in recent decades to be all too enthusiastic about large infrastructure projects and allowing massive urban development. And in many cases, the archaeological work around these projects takes the form of conservation by record, i.e. the site often in a limited time frame, sorry, uh, dig the site, often in a limited time frame, take photos and drawings of everything, recover salvageable ar uh, artefacts, and then let the bulldozers obliterate it. Okay, apparently the Facebook feed is now active. <laughs> I tell you, it's just one of those, isn't it? It's one of those nights. It, I think it's painful uh, for, it's a painful topic. Uh, and, and I think that is, you know, reflecting itself in the technological issues tonight it's difficult it's 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 a hurtful thing however there are isolated incidents where something is saved in 1999 the design of a new bypass motorway in county clare was altered so as not to destroy a sacred fairy bush and that's the one i mentioned earlier on but these successes are few and far between the point here is that although monuments cannot be attended by custodians or protectors 365 days and nights a year, the government can be seen to send the wrong signals in relation to our monuments. It is apparently that archaeology, it is apparent that archaeology can be sacrificed if the price is right. The destruction of monuments is a historical problem. Long before modern roads and cars and shopping centres and housing estates, monuments, even huge ones, were being obliterated from the landscape. Margaret Kiernan has to head off. Margaret, farewell. We'll see you next time. Stay well. There is a common misconception that the, that the church was responsible for destroying monuments. However, it is apparent that most of the damage and destruction has been carried out in the past few centuries, and much of it by careless and ignorant landowners, tenant, tenants, farmers, and foreign occupiers. Um, 
I think the, the issue with the church and monuments is that there isn't very much evidence that the church destroyed them. Um, and the evidence in, in mythology would be very, very sparse. I mean, there's a description of St. Patrick uh, damaging or destroying the idol of Crom Croch in my Schlecht in Cavan uh, with a sledgehammer. Uh, but such descriptions, as I say, are very few and far between. And it is apparent uh, from um, uh, the uh, what has been said and written by archaeologists, especially in the 20th century, that the past few uh, centuries in particular have been devastating for Irish archaeological monuments. And uh, an awful lot of that damage has got nothing to do with the church. It's got more to do with greed. I have spent years documenting the sad case of a monument known as Ireland's Stonehenge, a huge henge, and we've covered this in previous episodes, or an embanked enclosure incorporating several circles of stones <clears throat> that was documented in the 1740s, but which in the course of the following century was completely obliterated from the landscape. Its very location unknown until its footprint was found in an old aerial image in the 1990s. Karen Begg says Arch ArchDB, yes indeed. A passage tomb on Montpellier Hill overlooking Dublin City was largely destroyed in the 1720s when its stones were removed to, to construct a shooting lodge known as the Hellfire Club. So the, the, the grand old boys could go up to, into the mountains and have their weekend hunts. Megan says, if anything, people took stone to recycle it rather than to destroy the site for any, but that's very true. Farmers were stealing stones for walls all along. That's true, and that's true in the case of Carn Bay, Ireland Stonehenge, because a lot of those stones apparently were used for either uh, wall, wall, walls and gateposts, or some of it was used and crunched up and used as road foundation material. The excessive damage seen at Douth in the 1840s was replicated in the same century at Loch Crew, where a large cairn on Carnban, or Carnban West, you might know it as, the westernmost of the hills of Loch Crew, was similarly despoiled. The cairns were then once, sorry, the cairns there were once covered with white quartz, but it was mostly gradually removed, apparently to be reused as decorative stone on modern graves. A curious thing. These are just isolated examples, but hundreds of prehistoric monuments, including many from the Neolithic, were destroyed or badly damaged over the last few centuries. And I've just seen a typo. The word Neolithic is spelled wrong, and I will correct that on the blog post later on. While many farmers are very respectful about monuments on their land, the historical record of agriculture in relation towards preservation of ring forts another mistake, uh, barrows and other structures has not been good. The fact that so many of these only become visible as crop marks during rare drought conditions is perhaps indicative of just how many of them have been levelled by ploughing in the past century. You may have seen uh, some of the monuments that I found in aerial images uh, taken by satellite and Google Maps and Apple Maps and also with, with the drone. And again, the reason they turn up, uh, the reason they weren't known before they suddenly appear is because they were flattened at some point in the past. The difference now is that the public should be much better educated about our monuments, our heritage and our history than before. So there should be little excuse for damage to and removal of monumental remains. So what more can be done? I think that we still fail to grasp the value of our monumental and indeed mythic heritage. Too often we see it as something for the tourists and indeed the increased footfall to many ancient monuments is part of the problem. At the Hill of Tara, for instance, a conservation plan is being formulated partly as a response to the gradual erosion of parts of monuments there caused by the constant tramping of visitors' feet over them. And these are earthen mounds, these are not stone mounds. A similar plan is needed for the Loch Crew complex, where many unroofed cairns lie open to the elements, slowly degrading and disappearing under the effects of the harsh Irish weather. The main image at the top of this page, that's the blog, you'll see it on the Mythical Ireland website, shows Cairn S at Loch Crew, one such monument which is clearly feeling the effects of decades of neglect, and at the same time the detrimental results of increased visitor numbers. It may be that part of the solution here will be the fencing off of more monuments to prevent any access to them. That would be a shame, but at least it would guarantee their survival for another generation. Education would be a good starting place, and thank you to all the people who've suggested that, because I think that's the, uh, that is the single biggest thing that we can do.
There is a clear need for more education in our schools about the precious nature of the Neolithic monuments in particular and the importance of protecting our historic and prehistoric monuments and remnants for future generations. After all, the reason many of them survive today is because our own ancestors ensured they were protected. There needs to be a greater awareness among young people of our mythology too. In former times, going back perhaps by only about three generations, a majority of Irish people would have been aware of and indeed would have propagated the old stories about the sacred places in their locality. Sadly, Irish mythology is not taught in our schools today, not to any, excuse me, systematic effect. Uh, it is taught sporadically, thrown in here and there. And apart from the very well-known tales, such as the Salmon of Knowledge and the Children of Lear, perhaps little is done to teach young people about the stories in their own areas. And I'm, 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 I'm talking about generally, so I'm sure that there are plenty of schools who've done special projects about heritage, and that's wonderful to see, of course. But I think it needs to be part of the curriculum. Uh, you know, uh, they were talking about doing away with history as a subject uh, for the Leaving Certificate, weren't they, here in Ireland? I'm pretty sure they were. That would be a disaster. <clears throat> but if we can teach children the true value of our heritage and not just the apparent value to tourism, as if monuments were a commodity, that would be a great starting place. Perhaps a campaign to highlight the neglect of archaeology and monuments should be directed towards sitting government ministers and TDs. When the new coalition government was announced at the end of June, a friend of mine who's a very well-known and respected archaeologist posted this as his Facebook status. Arts and heritage? Nope. Culture and heritage? Nope. Tourism and heritage? Nope. Housing, planning and heritage? Really? And this is a further indication of the poor priority that heritage receives. The fact that heritage has been lumped in with housing and planning is not just supremely ironic, but indeed bitterly disappointing to many who are interested in the conservation of our past. Planning and housing have been responsible for the destruction of huge amounts of archaeology, and there is a demonstrable need for the separation of the two. Many construction developments are green-lighted with little regard for the consequences to archaeology. It is a cynical and deeply upsetting situation to see heritage and planning as part of the same government department. I suggest we write to our TDs and ministers and let them know of our disgust over this conflict of interests. More signage is needed at these monuments, which clearly outline the penalties for interference with or damage to the structures. This will perhaps not deter the tiny minority of professional treasure hunters who clearly don't care for the law, but it should help to bring a better awareness and indeed highlight the incalculable value of the monuments. Fines and prison terms for such offences should be publicised widely. And I should probably revisit the blog post and add in this suggestion of solar powered uh, webcams uh, broadcasting uh, the images to the web 24-7. Uh, I think that would be a significant deterrent. I really do. Heritage centres, tourist office, offices and visitor sites also have a role to play because they can help highlight to visitors the delicate and cherished nature of the Stone Age sites in particular and thus advise people how to visit them without causing damage. Now, I know many of them are doing that already in fairness to them, uh, so I'm not being critical of them. A lot of heritage centres and tourist offices are, are, are obviously uh, have a, a custodianship role, which they take very seriously. So it, it's not fair to lump it on them, uh, but they definitely can help. The very best way to protect monuments is to empower the local communities to do so. In the old days, this was done through custodianship, a practice still carried out in certain parts of the country. A local family or community group takes custodianship of a site and tends to it and keeps an eye on it. This might not work for mountaintop cairns, but is certainly a very positive and, and constructive step in protecting uh, monuments elsewhere. So we come to the question of who to complain to. Uh, Megan Walters makes a point, moving the heavy hand of capitalism is a monumental task. You have to make everything about money, which is like making a deal with the devil. It is also important to publicise information about the authorities responsible for the monuments. I'm not sure that everybody knows it, but if you witness damage to a national monument, you should contact the National Monument Service by phone, 
on 01-888-2000 or email at nationalmonuments at chg.gov.ie. That's chg.gov.ie as soon as possible. If you witness someone causing damage to a monument or using a metal detector close to a monument in Ireland, immediately contact your local Gardaí, who are the Irish police. Also, it, be, it would be no harm in any case to contact your local minister or TD, senator, Cahirlock, mayor, councillor or other public representative to highlight these issues. Every monument should have signs warning about the penalties of vandalism. Those in particular danger might need to be fenced off. Ask, and ask your representative to lobby for a new programme of education about our past. Let us not hand down an empty legacy to those who come after us. Let them not be the ones who read in their history books about the great stone monuments of hoary antiquity that were destroyed, abandoned and left to ruin by a selfish, careless or ignorant generation. Let us ensure the sad legacy of Ireland's Stonehenge is not repeated. And thus ends uh, my uh, long read blog post about the matter, which I now realise I could considerably le lengthen with some of the fantastic suggestions you know, Anne Hurley, he says, that's so true. It should always be part of the curriculum, but not just educating them physically. Uh, sorry, not just educating them, physically bringing them on field trips also and educate them to the protection of these precious sites. Yeah, that's a very good uh, question or a point, Anne. But I have written in uh, Island of the Setting Sun, and I think perhaps I mentioned it um, in the first chapter or the introduction to Drone Henge about my own introduction to the monuments of the Boyne Valley, which was on a school tour as a young a youngster, probably at the age of six or seven years, and being fascinated by the enormity of them, uh, and then being told how old they were. And that could have been a key moment in... Yes, okay, and we can't forget to mention the dogs. Coda wants us to talk about the dogs. Guard dogs. Somebody else mentioned that. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you let me be a guard dog and I won't let anyone near them. Um, so that you would not know. I mean, that's so true, Anne. Actually, that is brilliant. Uh, I would say that is one of the incidents. There were several incidents that kind of sort of snowballed into a bigger thing for me with regards to, you know, how mythical Ireland has its origins. So if, if you can bring a classroom or a like a whole year of school children. You could bring 100 school children on a school tour. I know with COVID, everything's difficult at the moment, but let's just say under normal circumstances, you brought 100 children to La Cru or to Four Knox or to the Hill of Tara. If one of those kids has a spark lit in their head, you know, one of them gets real excited about this and you don't know what they're going to end up doing and how they are going to end up inspiring others, you know? It's a double-edged sword for me. I've written four books, and I'm in the process of written of writing a fifth, and my first book is being republished. It would appear from reading those that I am encouraging people to visit these sites, and I suppose you could say that I am. At the same time, I argue in those books vehemently for a better protection of those sites. If you read, for instance, the epilogue of Island of the Setting Sun, uh, you'll see uh, that I go on a little bit of a mini rant about it. Um, so it is a double-edged sword. It's like you want to promote interest in them, but not to the point where people can think that, oh, I'll go there and I'll walk all over it and I'll have a picnic on top of it and sure, who cares? It's to go there respectfully. And I think that is an area in which we can all learn, and myself included. I have had groups at Lock Crew walking around the Cairns and walking on the Cairns. Uh, uh, perhaps I am part of the problem. You know, um, and 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 that awareness is you can solve problems when you're aware uh, that you and your generation are part of the problem. You know, hi, Coda. Yes, he would make a great guard dog, says Kathy May. <laughs> Coda, the monument canine, says Desiree. Guard bulls. Yeah, um, there are lots of signs on, on farm gates around Ireland saying beware of the bull. Now, I, I'm not going to challenge you to trespass. All I'm saying is, uh, I suspect that a great deal of those are what they say on the sign, a load of bull. I suspect that probably seven or eight out of 10 of those uh, uh, 
in, in, in a seven or eight or out of ten of those cases there are no bulls, uh, but it's a deterrent. And that's part of it, a deterrent. Yeah. I'm just reading the comments again, and, and, and we're getting back to the deterrent thing, but we're also getting back to education. There is another problem that we've already spoken about, and that is that there are some people that just can't be educated. They just can't be told. Uh, there's a small but very, very vocal uh, minority in Ireland of people who um, protest about things, and they, they, they are paranoid. Uh, they they watch conspiracy theory videos and they, uh, you know, propagate conspiracy theory stuff from websites. People who are, are, tell us that COVID-19 is uh, transmitted through 5G masts. Like I'm a licensed radio amateur and I just, you know, I roll my eyes when I hear nonsense like that. And there's a certain type of person that just doesn't deal with reality. Uh, but I still think that that doesn't mean you should just ignore the problem. Um, you have to still do everything that you can so that it can't be said in the future. There was this one particular generation of people who really didn't care for anything but themselves and let the whole thing fall to, you know, smithereens. Um, Yvette says, pride of place. Imagine if this was where Fionn did something in your area, for example. Yeah, exactly. And tie in the mythology. I mean, sometime in the past 50 years, we've lost interest in mythology in our in our um, local, not all of them now. And again, not to use the broad um, sweeping brush, but you know, if you look at the early issues, for instance, of the Louth Archaeological Journal, I think I've said this before, there's a mixture of uh, uh, articles that are about archaeology and history uh, interspersed with articles about mythology and folklore. And at some point in the past 50 years, we've abandoned this interest in mythology and folklore. We're just very dismissive of it. You know, ah, it's only a story, it's only this and it's only that. That mythology actually helped uh, maintain uh, an, an aura of respect and deference, uh, reverence uh, for the monuments. And I suppose if you take that away, then a monument that is a cairn, for instance, just becomes a heap of stones or a ring fort just becomes a, ah, it's just another of those rings in a field, you know? You no longer have that reverence connected with it. Now, I'm not, suspect, I'm not suggesting that we go back to the days of abject superstition about everything. But the story of the fairies, uh, you know, don't, don't interfere with the monument or the fairies. Well, that did genuinely, I think, protect a lot of monuments from damage. You know, Neil Hughes says, beware of the fairy folk. Local folklore is taken much less seriously in the US as well, says Rowan. I think part of the problem is we don't tell the stories we have. It's, you're not trying to tell the story as if it's history. You're trying, what you want to do is give people an appreciation of the stories, but also give them some faculty through their education by which they can understand uh, the allegories and the metaphors and the symbols of this mythology, what they actually might mean. And why they might also be a record of, of past events, uh, not to say that all myths are allegorical, you know. Nora Gaffney O'Connor says, totally agree. Tell people this spot is where this legend happened. Look around. Imagine this battle going on in that field. A hundred percent, you know. Storytellers arise, says Rowan Grove. Yes, let's let's try and end on a, on a, on a high note because I know it's been a difficult... I, I, I had to take this on uh it's a subject that has reached uh, has received a lot of attention lately uh it, it is i think beneficial for us to try and be constructive uh, and not to be constantly pointing out all the problems it's easy to point out the problems it's less easy to point out the solutions uh, it needs the respect of the community leaders to legislate against any form of damage big businesses need to be held accountable to lead by example says adele perth can i say something at this point uh, i know it might be controversial um I, I I think I think we could do with a female Taoiseach in Ireland. I think the countries that are doing the best at the moment with their dealing with the COVID crisis and with other issues, especially social issues, 
issues of education, issues of discrimination and, and racism, issues of um, you know healthcare, etc., which are primary issues in so many d- democracies. It seems to me that the countries that have women leading them are at the moment are doing the best, and perhaps you know uh, we could do with a stint. Uh, with a female Taoiseach at our head. We had uh, uh, a couple of uh, female presidents. Now, the presidents don't really have any legislative power. Um, It's more of a ceremonial role in Ireland, the presidential role. But I think if we had a female Taoiseach, um, you know, um, I mean, if you look at the makeup of government, again, um, I don't want to be too political or too controversial. Mythical Ireland, as I say, I try I try to be non-political. I try to be non-religious. I'm agnostic myself, so I try to stay away from uh, religion in general. And I know it's a very uh, controversial area, and politics is the same. We had an election, and there was sort of a very split vote, and the old club got back in again. And there's an argument to be made that, you know, some of these individuals and the parties uh, that uh, they represent were part of the issue around, for instance, the routing of the M3 motorway, uh, which is only, we're only going back less than two decades ago. Um, and part of, you know, the previous sort of let's allow uh, the Celtic Tiger to, to run out of control and let's allow buildings uh, to, prop, to, prop up, to crop up everywhere and let's not protect heritage. Uh, anyway, that's uh, just... Um, Perhaps, uh, 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 you know, I know that these things will always provoke controversy any time uh, that religion or politics is brought into discussions in general, people it gets people's backs up. Uh, you know, what we're trying to do is to make sure that people uh, say, <laughs> Nick, Nick, I'm not going to read out your comment, but I am laughing. <laughs> It depends on your point of view, I suppose. Yeah, I know, I know. But I am, I'm thinking more about those those um, female leaders at the moment who are showing real leadership in crisis, in crises, uh, and doing a good job. But how do you measure who's doing a good job? You know, I don't know. Remembering that um, the sovereignty, the tutelary deities of Ireland were always feminine. The Kalyuk uh, was a very, very important deity in prehistory. Uh, Eru, uh, another sovereignty deity. Uh, Maeve, another sovereignty deity. Uh, the 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 political rulers had to be married in a sacred marriage to the Bonashri, uh, to uh, the landscape and the the, the tutelary deity. Um, there had to be a right relationship there. And of course, as I said, because we seem to have commoditized everything, even monuments, everything has a price now. And in some cases, things that should be priceless. In other words, you couldn't possibly put a value on a on a, a five thousand year old passage tomb. You know, all of a sudden, in the scheme of things, uh, have have a a price. Anyway, I, I I'm sorry that I've uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, another campaign that's been going on in Northern Ireland, which is under a different jurisdiction. Uh, part of the United Kingdom, but it has its own legislative uh, assembly, is at uh, Knock uh, Ivy, where it seems to me that the planning authorities have completely failed uh, to take account of the cairn uh, on the mountaintop there. And there's a whole campaign going on there, which I've done my best to, to highlight by sharing their messages and their posts over the last few years. And uh, the problem there is that it seems that, you know, you know, it's just like heritage, heritage was basically just pushed to one side in the whole consideration of planning for communications mast. I think that's what it was, a communications mast. And we are, of course, not just in danger of having that happen here in the Republic, but that kind of has already happened. Uh, Whereas I said, you know, uh, uh, you know, heritage, it just all of a sudden gets pushed into a basement at the end of a corridor, last door on the left, and the planning is like, oh yeah, let's let's talk to planning about this, and let's talk to finance about this, uh, sure. but let's leave heritage uh, in the corner. I, I've just been signalled that the reason that Coda is barking is because <clears throat> it's his feeding time, his second feeding time of the day. I have to leave it with you uh, because uh, he has to be fed, uh, and uh, 
that's why he's uh, uh, perhaps being a little bit vocal. I'm sorry that we kind of got dragged into a little bit of negativity this evening. Uh, I believe that it's not possible uh, to move forward without first highlighting these things. Uh, can I also say, too, uh, in the past week, uh, that one of the greatest uh, uh, human beings uh, and leaders uh, of modern Irish history passed away, and, and that was John Hume, who was leader of the SDLP, uh, who was a human rights uh, activist and a political activist, and who was one of those voices during the decades of uh, tr the troubles and the bombings and the shootings and the killings and the maimings and the beatings in Northern Ireland, uh, who advocated at all times, uh, well, two principal things, I think. Uh, one was peaceful protest, and the other was respect for difference. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, I believe, where, where we again have to go back to education. Uh, so anyway, a very good night. You don't forget, we are in, still in the middle of a pandemic. Keep washing your hands, keep using hand sanitizer, social distancing, you know. Uh, it's become compulsory in Ireland. I'm glad to report to wear a mask when you're in a supermarket or in a crowded public place. Uh, so <laughs> those who don't wear them <coughs> are, are being selfish and foolish. Uh, look, um, in the meantime, just stay safe and stay sound. Don't forget also to have a look at Patreon com and consider becoming a patron of mythical Ireland. your support as always would be greatly received in the meantime uh i would hope uh, to do at least one unannounced uh, live <coughs> live stream from somewhere out in the landscape this week uh, i i know that you value those greatly it's there's something really nice about bringing you to a place uh, when you're in the far corners of the earth and you're seeing this particular piece of irish landscape it seems to it seems to help people relax and breathe uh, through the, through the issues that we're having so I'll do that. I'll do my very best to do that. And we'll return then with the regular Irish, uh, live Irish myths uh, next Monday. They're once weekly at the moment. On occasion, there'll be mo more than once weekly when we have to deal with uh, a subject that, that's bigger than one single episode. Anyway, in the meantime, thanks uh, for tuning in. As always, don't forget that the live stream on YouTube is automatically saved as a video. The live stream on YouTube, uh, sorry, Facebook, and YouTube, they're both saved, uh, so you can access them afterwards if you missed a uh, part or all of the discussion. Uh, in the meantime, uh, good night to you all, and thanks for watching, and I'll see you, hopefully, all very soon. Thank you very especially for your wonderful feedback and for your questions and comments. Good night to everyone. Sláin. <laughs>